Hi, I am uh, Sivji Kumar Jha. Um, I am going to talk about uh, streaming and uh, structured uh, data streaming um, at that. You can uh, reach me out on LinkedIn or you can uh, talk to me on Twitter after the talk if you want to discuss something pretty open to that. And uh, I hope you're really having uh, fun with uh, streaming because it's the last day. I'll uh, keep the talk a little bit light. But uh, if you want to uh, drop a question or you want to gently say hi, please reach out to me over uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. So um, a bit about me. I am a senior member of technical staff at Nutanix. Um, my work primarily revolves around platform engineering. And uh, recently, I've been um, working on databases. I used to work at MySQL in the beginning. Um, I worked on a service oriented architecture where I worked on microservices design, implementation, and all of that um, infrastructure. And uh, lately, I have been working on streaming technologies for the uh, last couple of years. And uh, it's been mostly based on uh, Apache Pulsar and uh, the ecosystem around it. I uh, love working on distributed data systems. And uh, I find open source uh, software and very, very sort of helpful. Uh, they help me learn as well as adapt them uh, to use my use cases. And uh, I have myself done contributions in uh, Apache Pulsar uh, with code, with documentation, with testing, uh, all of that. And then I used to work for MySQL. So a lot of my uh, code uh, is there in MySQL as well. Uh, in this uh, presentation, we will look at uh, why schema. Uh, we will look at uh, how. Um, where we will see what's the different ways of putting structure on top of your uh, data. We will look at uh, popular formats, what are the different choices, the trade-offs between them, like what's good with one and what's bad with it. Then the next one, what's good with it, what's bad with it. And then we will look at some examples and then we'll uh, see uh, some learnings that we've had over the years. Um, for why, we will uh, look at a little bit of history uh, to see uh, how over um, the last few decades, like four or five decades, we have evolved. And it does point towards something where it is pretty clear that having abstractions and forcing structures has, something, uh, has been something um, that has uh, helped adoption. So um, uh, it all started around 1960s, where it used to uh, use flat files to store data. Uh, obviously, uh, with flat files, the problem is um, how do you find data? And if you can, if you can't find it uh, optimally, uh, then um, reading is uh, so going to take time. Uh, writing in any form, like new data or an update or a delete, is going to um, need you to go find the file and then uh, perform these operations. So it's all going to be uh, slower. Uh, because we needed more structure, we went for uh, hierarchical databases where uh, there is a directory sort of structure on top of uh, data to organize it. And that's because we needed structure uh, to find things quickly. Um, in 1980s, we had this uh, nice thing where um, we started using relational algebra and on top of which uh, those concepts uh, came to databases. Uh, and we had uh, SQL databases or uh, relational, data, relational databases as they are known. Um, this has a high level language like uh, SQL. Um, and then there are uh, abstractions like uh, tables and uh, columns, uh, data types, uh, all of those. And uh, of course, uh, uh, even since 1980s, uh, it's still uh, in option now in. 2021, so um, pretty much 40 years. And then you have to acknowledge that in uh, certain cases, um, the relational databases or SQL databases have been uh, really a thing of choice. Uh, now around uh, 2004, uh, we had this huge revolution where um, we had a lot of NoSQL databases. Kind of funny that uh, the name itself, NoSQL, is uh, what it says it is not. But um, uh, it was a jab at the skill databases. So the idea behind the skill databases was that um, 
you can trade off some structure we should not force as much structure and we should trade off some uh, asset properties some structure that uh, uh, tables and columns put we can uh, get away with some of them and then we can uh, gain a uh, scale and uh, availability uh, for that um, but then uh, the interesting thing is that around 2010s again we've had distributed sql databases like yugabyte um, like uh, cockroach uh, uh, db and uh, there again uh, trying to do the best of both these worlds uh, relational databases and nosql databases where they uh, provide distribution of data uh, as part of the server so they cater to your scale needs and at the same time they still support your asset properties they still support your tables and structures and all of that uh, so you see uh, tables and columns and uh, data primitive data types and all of that are uh, really uh, strong structures and these have uh, stood the test of time if you look at um, the streaming world itself um, and the history of it uh, kafka was built inside uh, linkedin and uh, then it uh, became an open source data uh, open source uh, streaming platform and then uh, it became uh, apache software then uh, came pulsar uh, almost sort of 5 years later uh, yahoo had some uh, use cases uh, where they wanted uh, some good scale uh, one cluster for queues and streams as well as a lot of good things about uh, enterprise readiness so they went ahead and uh, made pulsar for that um, and yahoo has uh, made some uh, nice distributed data uh, data systems like zookeeper uh, comes from uh, yahoo as well uh, bookkeeper uh, came out of there as well so um, <clears throat> yahoo again uh, built the new generation uh, of streaming platform and then uh, it came to open source and now it is an apache uh, project for uh, almost last 3 years now so if you look at the uh, evolution what does history tell us right uh, we used to uh, even if you look at the organization of data inside a computer system uh, we have bits but then we went ahead and uh, made a higher level abstraction with bytes then we said we will use primitive databases like integer is a combination of let's say on a given machine four bytes or eight bytes and then we said we will use object oriented databases so uh, we will have objects which have a lot of uh, attributes of primitive data types and we are now uh, trying to use object oriented languages uh, to model our uh, real world things uh, as objects. So you see uh, there also there is uh, abstraction and forced abstraction on top of which um, the apps are built. If you look at uh, uh, the history that we just uh, discussed, um, there were SQL databases in 1960s, then no SQL databases in 2004 and later. And now in 2010s, we had distributed SQL databases. So um, SQL has very uh, strict schema actually. Uh, evolution is difficult um, because alter tables and all can uh, take a lot of time doing online. But uh, people still want uh, all that abstraction of schema and uh, uh, enforcing schema uh, so the apps can be uh, forced to follow um, those schema when they produce or consume. The upgrade paths are easier. And um, if you look at the streaming world itself, we had Kafka and now um, sort of four or five years we, later, we had Pulsar. Both of them started with streaming just bytes. And then they later came up with the support for schema registry, which has all these constructs um, similar to uh, the tables and columns in the um, uh, relational uh, database world. Uh, <clears throat> you want to, uh, in my opinion, use um, schema um, as much as you can. There are, of course, certain cases where um, you want flexibility. Of course, that comes at a cost. We will discuss uh, the trade offs and um, we will look at uh, schema less world and uh, with schema, uh, as far as schema is concerned, what are the different choices and all of that. But if you have to uh, uh, make an error on one side, I would say maybe have schema. A lot of times I have felt that uh, in our industry, we are just a bit lazy uh, defining the schema up front so we go with um, schema lessness but uh, i would say uh, it it um, is worth giving it a good thought we will look at uh, schema a little bit and then we will look at um, apache pulsar's 
um, uh, constructs. Of course, uh, Kafka's are similar as well. So pretty much the same concepts apply uh, on Kafka side as well. But uh, we will uh, strict uh, will uh, stick to Pulsar for the example quotes, just because um, Apache Pulsar is the something that I have been using recently. <clears throat> so um, first of all, we will uh, look at a typical PubSub. A typical PubSub, uh, you will have a producing app and you will have a consuming app. You have a producer library that is typically uh, provided by the uh, platform itself. It could be Kafka. Uh, this could be um, Pulsar. Uh, they both have their own uh, client libraries, which have producer as well as uh, consumer. You embed this uh, client uh, inside the app uh, to produce, and the same client is embedded inside the uh, consumer app to uh, consume the data. Uh, but when you uh, design your schema, you also have to make sure that uh, going ahead in future, you will have a lot of producers, right? And then you will also have uh, a lot of consumers. So uh, when you talk of schema, um, your schema, uh, if you want to change uh, your schema, as in you want to add fields, you want to delete fields and all, you have to uh, see that uh, you have to do it in a way that uh, doing it across all the producers and consumers should not be a pain. And if you go that way, like what do you get uh, in return is something that you should uh, think of. Um, <clears throat> schema is nothing but uh, encoder plus decoder. When we say uh, encoder, um, you have an employee record. Uh, you can only store bytes in the computer system. So you uh, put down an uh, encoder, uh, which will encode the employee record to make it bytes. And uh, along with storing the bytes, you have to also store uh, some hint about the schema. Either you uh, keep the schema along with uh, the bytes, or you can maybe keep a schema ID or something, and maybe you have a remote server, which given the ID can give you um, the schema back. And using the um, bytes and the schema that we talked of, um, if we can pass it on to the decoder, to uh, give us back the employee record that we talked of. It is also something that is called serialization and deserialization. Encoder is your serialization and uh, decoder is your deserialization. Um, now, when we talk of uh, encoding and decoding, right? So uh, producing a schema or consuming data that uh, has been encoded with a schema, we have uh, three choices, right? Uh, regarding the placement of encoder and decoder. So choice number one is, you can uh, put the encoder in all the producing apps, right? Um, uh, and you can put the decoder in all the consuming apps. Choice number two is that um, you can put it in the producer library. Uh, the decoder will be in the consumer library. Um, the code is now abstracted out. The code is not split across your producers and consumers, but uh, uh, this producer uh, um, code base still lives inside the producer uh, app server. So um, when you have to evolve your schema, uh, once again, you have to now decide uh, how do you go uh, upgrading that across all your producer apps? Uh, how do you uh, go um, uh, upgrading the schema across all your uh, consumer apps? And uh, if you uh, upgrade, in what order will you upgrade? Will you go upgrade your producers first or will you go upgrade your consumers first? Will you upgrade all your producers first and then all your consumers? Or uh, will you uh, upgrade some of your producers and then some of your consumers? Like you, you have to decide uh, what will be your uh, upgrade path. And the choice number three is that um, instead of putting uh, encoder uh, here and decoder here, or uh, in the second choice here and here, you uh, actually uh, put it on top of the uh, streaming platform itself. Uh, and, and Kafka and Pulsar, uh, uh, which are uh, really the most adopted open source uh, streaming platforms, they both support uh, encoder, decoder as part of their uh, schema registry uh, out of the box. Uh, all the constructs are there, and if you can use that abstraction, uh, if it works for your use case, it's, it's great. And my opinion is something that has uh, worked well for us. 
Um, so uh, we talked about that abstraction uh, uh, of keeping the schema encoding and decoding logic uh, in uh, the apps, or you can put it on the producer consumer library, or you can put it on the uh, server side, which is Kafka or Pulsar uh, brokers or schema registry. Um, so uh, with the abstracted mod model, um, you have lighter apps so you, and uh, you can concentrate on uh, whatever you are doing inside the app following single responsibility principle. Um, evolution is easy because uh, versioning is supported out of the box with the schema uh, constructs that Kafka and Pulsar provide. Um, upgrades are easy because uh, there is a, a, a maturity that has developed over the years. Um, there is a process that you can follow depending on the use case. You have to decide which process do you like, and uh, you can just follow that. And uh, in our opinion, we have found that uh, going this route um, means we have had uh, less bugs. Um, if you go for the flexibility where uh, you put your producer consumer on, uh, <clears throat> um, so if you put your schema uh, encoding and decoding logic in all your producer apps and consumer apps, of course, you have some uh, good things like um, uh, schema format flexibility where one app is maybe uh, written uh, in Java, so it can use uh, Java serialization, deserialization. Other one is written in Python, so that app can use Python's pickle. The other one is written in Ruby, so maybe it can use Ruby. Or maybe let's say you are a Java shop inside your uh, organization, right? Every service is written in Java. In that case, maybe it's fine. But if you want to go polyglot from there, where there are some newer people, they want to use Python, and uh, uh, now they'll have problems uh, decoding the data that was produced using Java. Um, evolution is some of schema, like uh, the newer version of uh, schema, right? Uh, in future, you may add a new field or you may want to uh, delete a field from there. Um, if you want to uh, upgrade your schemas, you have to uh, decide on your versioning logic. That is something you'll have to still manage uh, either in your producer consumer libraries or you have to manage it on your producing and consuming app, and that too at um, each of the producing app and each of the consuming apps. <clears throat> and then they, you have to decide uh, what will be your upgrade path. Will you upgrade your producers first? Will you upgrade your consumers first? Or will you allow for any order and all of them works, right? And uh, in our opinion, we have generally found that um, this scenario is a little bit buggy and uh, even uh, difficult to debug when there are issues. Uh, as far as schema lessness is concerned, the whole um, schema lessness is something that is good for some use cases, in my opinion. But uh, <clears throat> there is no such thing as schema less, I think, because um, if you don't have schema, um, you can't decode bytes. So you can't get back your record that you wrote. Um, so if you are not uh, going schema full, you're going schema less, it just means. Uh, that uh, your schema is scattered randomly throughout your code. It is uh, impossible to troubleshoot anything non-trivial because there are a lot of assumptions and uh, there are no sort of explicit requirements that are documented and can be followed by your uh, future devs. Um, like if nothing is uh, absolutely best uh, all the time, the, in my opinion. So. Flexibility is a good choice uh, only uh, when uh, you have non uniform data of some form. Uh, for instance, you have um, in your event, you have a field uh, which decides how are you going to decode uh, the rest of the object. Maybe then um, you uh, want to be flexible and don't want to commit to it um, for uh, every message on that topic. Uh, maybe uh, you are consuming from some third party app and you want to leave uh, the representation schema or structure uh, to that third party and you are just a hop, uh, then you don't want to uh, fiddle with all the schema as an all. You just get whatever you get from there as bytes and stream those bytes back to maybe somewhere else for processing. And then, then you want to be uh, away from uh, all the schema handling. Um, and then if you have, uh, uh, a case where uh, schema changes happen very frequently, 
uh, then uh, schema migration can be a pain. So uh, schema flexibility, uh, schema less uh, is what uh, sort of uh, used uh, for that is a good choice. Uh, we will now look at uh, different ways of representing schemas. Uh, choice number one is uh, you can use uh, Java's uh, own serialization if you're using Java, you can use Pickle if you're using Python, you can use Bashel if you're using Ruby. Uh, <clears throat> the good part about it is that you're already familiar with your programming language. You have probably already used the serialization, deserialization in uh, some places in your app already. So you can just use that code. There's nothing new to learn. Um, but uh, if you use Java serialization and deserialization and uh, uh, you suddenly have some Python apps, you may have uh, problems because you have logged yourself inside uh, Java serialization and deserialization. And the Python's pickle will probably uh, work differently. And then uh, because uh, you are using your own serialization and deserialization, you will also have to think of your own uh, schema evolution path and uh, your order of upgrades among uh, producers and consumers. Uh, choice number two for schema representation is um, you already have your uh, REST APIs, so you can use something similar where you can represent requests and responses in um, REST in JSON or XML. Similarly, you can uh, represent your <coughs> uh, streaming uh, events uh, using the same JSON and XML, so you can share code. Um, there's <coughs> no learning curve. Um, it's all text, so uh, it is easy to debug. Um, one of the problems is uh, uh, space. So uh, if you look at JSON, if you look at your REST API uh, structures of uh, request and response, um, every message has the name of the key along with the value. So that key name is the extra data that you're sending with every message. And when you uh, work on a scale, uh, then that is a lot of extra data. So if you uh, want to be space efficient, this may not be a great idea. Um, and so JSON uh, has auto type detection, which can be problematic at types. Um, you have to also think of how are you going to introduce new types. Maybe there are some um, nested objects. Uh, will you ship a library with all your um, uh, data transfer objects or your uh, plain old Java objects, POJO? So will you make a library of all the POJOs and ship around and uh, be included in all the producer apps and all the consumer apps. Um, uh, maybe you will uh, document all the data types that are supported right now. Um, uh, you have to synchronize it between all the producer apps and all the consumer apps. And uh, maybe on the consumer, uh, you can make a logic where you say, uh, if you see a new field and uh, you in your uh, POJO don't have that new field, then you just ignore those fields at the time of decoding things. But yeah, I mean, we've tried this and we have actually burnt our hands. Um, what we actually uh, like is a struct schema, um, which is uh, in Pulsar's uh, world, struct schema is the abstraction below which you have Avros implementation and Thrift's implementation and uh, Proto's implementation. Uh, <clears throat> these are all binary formats where the key name is not shipped as part of every message. Um, so binary formats are all uh, space efficient. Um, they have been uh, in use in the streaming ecosystem over the years. So they have matured, they're all well-documented, libraries are supported. Uh, so um, converting from Avro or Thrift or Proto uh, to your programming language um, constructs like um, Avro file to Java's class file, uh, or Java's class file to Evro's um, uh, native file is pretty easy. They, there are uh, libraries available uh, in multiple different languages, pretty much all the uh, famous programming languages. So you can just use those and they are sort of pretty stable and the versioning and update path and all are already defined. Uh, one uh, issue that we have had is there is actually a little bit of a learning curve as far as um, this method is concerned. But uh, in our uh, opinion, I mean, uh, in the use cases that we have used these, uh, we found that uh, this learning curve um, is absolutely worth it. 
now we will look at apache pulsar very quickly what it is and uh, we will also look at uh, some code snippets some very very small code snippets uh, to show uh, how actually schema can be enforced um, when you um, write to your uh, stream platform as in apache pulsar or apache kafka um, so apache pulsar in my own opinion is um, the next generation of streaming after kafka um, it's completely cloud native uh, it's a distributed store and uh, it provides messaging as well as streaming uh, it has uh, a really nice modular design where uh, there is a stateless layer which is broker for serving the data uh, there is <coughs> um, a storage layer that is separate uh, you can horizontally scale either compute or store uh, completely independent of each other there is no latency and high throughput writes because it uses uh, rocks db and which implements lsm under the hood uh, so it takes good uh, advantage of uh, ssds if you have uh, high throughput um, with your ssds um, multi tenancy is supported of the box geo replication is supported of the box so you have that extra uh, disaster recovery uh, plus if you want to keep your data close to your consumers which are uh, distributed across the geography then uh, apache culture is a really uh, good uh, streaming platform to have <clears throat> so um, we will first look at uh, programming language own uh, serialization decentralization how to do that with uh, pulsars construct cons pulsars constructs um, let's say you have a user uh, which has uh, two attributes name and age um, you make a producer and you say that i want to use um, just bytes that i give you just uh, send it over to pulsar you make your user object you supply your name and age you make your user object um, using your programming languages serialization or decentralization like java zone python speaker or ruby's marshall using those those um, serialize this to bytes and then uh, this uh, message object you just say uh, hey producer send me uh, this uh, byte of message uh, to pulsar uh, this is what using byte schema if you want to use a string schema you tell your producer that you want to use a string and uh, you make a new producer you say a uh, schema dot string and then you say hey producer send me this new message which has the value as a uh, string you can have any structure in this you can have a maybe a json serialized a string or something all of that work and then the consumer knows that this json so it decentralizes it uh, on the consumer side you again say that i want to use string you define the schema type which is schema dot string and then when you receive you get back you get back your uh, string data if you use uh, avro to serialize and deserialize uh, when you make your producer you say you know what i have this uh, user class i want to make a uh, avro schema out of it and my producer should use that avro schema which is uh, made here so this avro schema is what i want to use when i produce so uh, encode my data um, using this schema and uh, uh, when you make a new message you uh, make the user object supplying the user name and then you have a uh, user age and uh, just uh, send it over on the consumer side you tell your consumer uh, instance that you want to uh, receive as the user object uh, you want to use avro and the avro has to be what uh, is built on top of the user class and then when you um, receive uh, messages going along uh, on this consumer app uh, you will uh, keep getting the user objects uh, <clears throat> so uh, schema registry is something that is uh, supported by pulsar as well as kafka um, it provides you topic to schema mapping uh, it stores your schema um, and uh, schema can be versioned again uh the whole upgrade path and evolution and all of that uh with different modes of compatibility uh when you do uh, schema evolution all of that as um, are uh, part of schema registry um producer when it produces messages it adds schema um and uh, it makes the new versions and all consumer uh fetches uh schema uh, and uh, data from the topic and deserializes it and gives it back to your app Uh, to use it schema itself you will if you look at the structure of it every schema of course has a name it has a payload which describes the attributes in the schema 
then type which is could be uh, it could be avro it could be proto um, it could be uh, uh, json and then you can have uh, um, um, properties which is just a map of uh, string and string so any um, thing that you want to send along uh, a schema evolution again you can use uh, manual uh, evolution where every time there is a, a new schema you actually uh, review that schema uh, and then uh, go ahead and apply that schema on the schema registry you have the rest api calls you have the um, cli commands and all of that to help you with your uh, manual evaluation process uh, we have used manual evaluation process for a while and it sort of works um, it's especially good if you have developers where they're not sort of uh, really uh, good with these things uh, so then it gives you time to sort of with the code review approach um, guide them with uh, schema evolution and new schemas or using the older schemas only um, but you can also use the automated approach uh, we will discuss more about it going ahead uh, basically what you will do is on a topic you will define the kind of con compatibility that you want the sort of amount of strictness that you want as far as the uh, evolution uh, of schema goes um, and then uh, depending on the compatibility you told your uh, topic um, and new schemas will be tested against those if they conform to the rules within that compatibility uh, mode then they will be accepted otherwise the new schema will be uh, rejected by the producer so there are a lot of different compatibility and modes always compatible mode uh, will always accept your new version of schema so if you send a new message which has a completely different schema it will assume that yeah you know what like i'll take this as the new version <clears throat> uh, always incompatible is basically uh, you want to disable schema evolution there is one schema and everybody should just uh, use this schema forever backward compatibility uh, is uh, where your uh, <clears throat> current uh, new schema will be checked against uh, the previous schema for backward compatibility so for instance you have um, a new schema which is let's say you already had v1 and v2 and the new schema is v3 so v3 will be checked against v2 to make sure um, that v3 is backward compatible with v2 uh, in this mode you can add optional fields you can uh, delete fields and uh, you have to upgrade your consumer first backward transitive is similar to backward uh, except for the fact that if you have a new schema v3 and v2 and v1 were already there then v3 uh, will be checked for backward compatibility against v2 and v3 will also be checked for backward compatibility against v1 uh, forward compatibility again uh, is uh, checking for forward compatibility against only v2 uh, here you can add fields uh, but you can only delete optional fields and you have to upgrade your producer first forward transitive is where uh, if your new schema a version is again v3 it will be changed checked for forward compatibility um, against v2 as well as v1 um, full compatibility is backward as uh, plus forward and full transitive is full compatibility uh, checked against all the previous versions uh, if you look at um, typical uh, producer workflow uh, you will have a new uh, piece of data that is coming through it will meet the producer the producer will go um, look for uh, the schema information for this topic uh, <clears throat> so now it will look at your schema and see that uh, is this schema uh, already part of uh, the schema registry for this topic if it is already there uh, then it will accept uh, it will connect the producer and then you can uh, keep producing uh, data yeah <laughs> If this schema was not registered already, then uh, it will check uh, if you have uh, enabled auto update. If auto update is enabled, then it will check for the compatibility mode. Um, given this compatibility mode, now it will check for um, uh, the uh, uh, if if it will, it will check if this new schema conforms to the rules imposed by this compatibility strategy. And if this new schema is fine, then against uh, this schema is registered in the schema registry and you get back a new version of the schema and then your producer is connected and you can go happily producing uh, more and more uh, data on top of this new schema uh, now if your update uh, schema is enabled and uh, your uh, 
compatibility mode tells you that the new schema that you are trying to submit does not conform to the rules of compatibility mode, uh, then your producer will uh, reject the message. And uh, this is actually a good place where we've actually caught a lot of bugs in our apps that seep through and try to produce the wrong data. Uh, on the consumer, again, um, uh, the consumer, when uh, it, uh, the app, when it comes up, it uh, tries to uh, connect the consumer to the broker. Again, the consumer gets the schema information. It goes ahead, uh, uh, checks if the data uh, that it wants to consume, uh, <clears throat> the schema, uh, uh, the local producer has a, uh, local uh, producer and consumer have uh, all been there. Uh, if they're all there, uh, then uh, it'll uh, check for compatibility strategy. And if everything uh, uh, in the new uh, schema attributes is compatible with the old ones, uh, according to the compatibility rules, then it is passed through. Otherwise, it will go and check if your um, auto update is enabled. If it is enabled, then this new schema that you supplied as part of the uh, consumer definition, we looked at that code previously, that is, uh, so that is registered and then uh, your uh, consumer can now uh, connect again. Um, otherwise, uh, <clears throat> uh, your uh, consumer cannot uh, connect to the broker. The broker will uh, reject, uh, reject the uh, connection request from the consumer app and throw an error. Uh, if you want to use on the producer side, if you want to use the semantics of uh, Pulsar, the workflow that we just uh, saw, in, saw in the flow diagram, then when making the producer, you just say schema dot auto produce and consumer you say, um, schema dot auto consume. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the other learning that we have had uh, over last couple of years using uh, schemas is that you don't always want to bind your uh, topic and schema one to one. Uh, rather, we prefer relative ordering. So um, you would know that uh, all the messages on one topic, or if you are using partition topic, all the messages on one partition uh, are. Uh, 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 always ordered. So what we do is uh, we keep a domain. In that domain, you may have uh, multiple different types of uh, objects like user, account, and the subscription of that account. Uh, and on that topic, we want to uh, evolve all the schemas parallelly. So uh, when you submit uh, user v3, it uh, checks for compatibility only against user v2 and not against account v2. So all the different objects uh, have their own evolution paths. And then uh, uh, if your uh, source and sync apart from the uh, streaming platform itself, like Pulsar has um, source and sync support with Flink and Spark and Elasticsearch and whatnot. So um, you can throw the same schema across your pipeline um, if your use case allows for it. If of course you decorate um, your uh, data uh, over uh, Pulsar or some uh, place in your uh, uh, pipeline, then of course, uh, your schema changes. Um, uh, lastly, um, our own learnings. Um, uh, we think uh, Avro uh, is good, uh, Proto and uh, JSON are, are good as well, but I think uh, Avro's adoption is something that I've always found good. Um, uh, if you uh, have a lot of data, then you want to be space efficient, so binary representation is good. Um, if you uh, if your use case allows for it, use the schema management. Uh, only use flexibility if you really need it. Uh, use schema registry by default. Uh, I would recommend uh, Avro. It's, it's been good for us, uh, and uh, it's always good to put that extra effort and set the compatibility and evolution path and upgrade path, upgrade order, uh, all of those uh, upfront and uh, force it uh, for the producers and consumers to follow it. So uh, I've left uh, some references if you want to read more. And uh, then uh, these are my contacts. You can talk to me over LinkedIn. Uh, you can see my previous talks on my YouTube playlist. Uh, and then uh, my uh, slides, I leave them on my, on my uh, slide share account. You can also talk to me on Twitter. So uh, do let me know if you have any questions or if you just want to say uh, hello. Uh, thank you.